evening from the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister, in which they asked to make a statement to the Assembly on the Executive's approach to coronavirus decision making. First Minister and Deputy First Minister said that given the importance of the statement in setting out the way forward in relation to the current crisis, that they would be grateful if Mr Speaker could give consideration to them making the statement under the same seating arrangements and question format that have been put in place for the ad hoc committee. In light of the particular circumstances, Mr Speaker was content to put in place these arrangements on an exceptional basis. The Business Committee therefore agreed to bring forward the motion to suspend Sanding Order 18A5, which the Assembly agreed to earlier today. This means that we will have, flex I beg your pardon. This means that we will have flexibility to go beyond an hour, uh, which I may allow depending upon the number of members wishing to ask a question. Before I call the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister, I remind members that in light of social distancing being observed by parties, I have relaxed the Speaker's ruling that members must be in the chamber to hear a statement if they want to ask a question. Members do still have to make sure that their name is on the speaking list if they wish to be called, but they can do this by rising in their place as well as notifying the business office or the Speaker's table directly. I remind members to please be concise in asking their questions. This is not an opportunity for debate and long introductions will not be allowed. This is for fairness, to allow members from smaller parties who are further down the list to ensure that they get an opportunity to ask questions too. As per the arrangements in the ad hoc committee, those members who ask short and focused questions will be invited to ask a supplementary question. Finally, I should advise members that the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister will be making a joint statement and either or both of them may respond to a particular question, although I would say to both of them you do not have to respond to all of them. I call the First Minister to make the statement. First Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, and thank you for the opportunity to update the Assembly today. Since the 7th of April, updates have been provided by myself and the Deputy First Minister, by Ministers in the Executive, and the Junior Ministers brought forward the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions Regulations to the Assembly for approval. The common themes and threads across all of our updates have been the devastating nature of COVID-19, the need to protect our health service, the interventions which have been made by departments, and the need to follow the restrictions to keep safe and protect the NHS. Today we wish to update you on our latest review of the restrictions and our decision-making process for coming reviews. These have been discussed in detail by the Executive, and we are publishing coronavirus, the Executive approach to decision-making, later today. This is our five-step plan to aid recovery and renewal. Our discussions have been guided and assisted by the inputs from the Chief Medical Officer and the Chief Scientific Advisor, and we have been grateful for their advice. The Economy Minister is also working on a further document dedicated to economic recovery, which will dovetail with this roadmap and be published subsequently in the coming days. The Executive agreed that now is not the time to lift restrictions, and we made that announcement on Thursday of last week. We also agreed that the time is right to set out our thinking and explain how we will approach decision-making, what we will take into account, and how we see restrictions easing. As of today, we remain subject to restrictions, which no one wants to last a day longer than is absolutely necessary. These are measures we would not contemplate in normal times. We know that they are having a significant effect on people's ability to live their lives the way they and we want. So we wanted to set out for the Assembly today our thoughts on how we may move forward when the time is right. Just as there was no rule book for putting the restrictions in place, there is no set pathway for lifting the restrictions either. Countries and jurisdictions are taking some tentative steps to lift restrictions. Some have published criteria and principles, and some have outlined a timetable. Each are different. And there are good reasons for that. Our decisions must be based on what is happening here, taking account of our particular circumstances within the Four Nations approach. Differences and nuances between the jurisdictions in the United Kingdom will emerge. The Four Nations discussions will, however, continue. 
And to that end, we welcome the announcement by the Prime Minister on the establishment of a new joint biosecurity centre to monitor the levels of infection and identify specific actions in regions where spikes occur. The devolved administrations will participate in and contribute to its work. We will also continue to engage, of course, with our counterparts in the Irish Republic. We will remain focused on the health and well-being of our people, on our society and our economy as a whole. We will be driven by science. We will be driven by the need to emerge from the current arrangements in the safest way possible, step by step. This will require a series of judgments and decisions as we move through. Last week, we considered very carefully the effect restrictions are having on our people. We know you want clarity on things that matter very much to you, such as visiting relatives, going to work, taking your children to school. We decided collectively that the time is not right for making major steps. We will continue to consider whether some modest steps can be taken, and if they can, we will do that ahead of the next review. Against the background of last week's decisions, we fully appreciate that people want as much information as we can give on the next steps. That is why we are publishing our document today, and we will move forward with care, step by step, with a clear goal of emerging from the situation safely. We must continue to avoid the health service being overwhelmed. COVID-19 spreads in a way which isn't visible in real time. A person who catches it today may not have symptoms immediately, but may well need hospital treatment in coming weeks. So the things we do today as citizens have an impact in the near future. And if restrictions are lifted too soon, or in a way that we cannot control, we will see the negative results of that in the days and weeks ahead. So we will also keep our approach and document under review. As we move forward, we will address any oversights and make improvements to how we consider the issues that matter to our people, to their lives, families and livelihoods. We will not take a set in stone approach if there are things we can do better and do differently. COVID-19 spreads at a rate which isn't visible in real time either. Before the restrictions were put in place, each person with COVID-19 was likely to pass it on to two to, two, to three people. The time it was taking for COVID-19 cases to double was shortening, and we were faced with a growth which could have overwhelmed the NHS. The current transmission rate of each person infecting less on average than one has been achieved because of the restrictions being in place and adherence to them. We cannot allow the transfer rate to rise to uncontrollable numbers, and that is why we cannot lift the restrictions too early, and we must continue to ask everyone to play their part every day. The transmission rate, or R as it is more properly known, was key to the review last week. It will continue to be central to the judgments we will make in the coming weeks. Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, the Executive's document sets out the way in which we approach each review of the restrictions. We must work our way through on the basis of risk-assessed incremental steps and judgments. But it is equally important that we develop a very clear vision of where we want to be as we emerge from this crisis. The document sets out an indication of how key aspects of life may progress through different stages as we emerge from this situation. They will not necessarily all move forward at the same time, and they will only move forward if it is safe to do so. In reaching our judgments, we will think about the outcomes we need for the health and well-being of our people, the economy and our society. We will uh, preserve, rebuild and develop aspects of our life that are most important to us. We will think about what our people have been through their experiences over this last few weeks and how we can best assist with the adjustment to the new normal. And there will be a new normal. COVID-19 will not be beaten through restrictions. We may be living with it while clinical interventions are being developed. We may have to embed social distancing even further in how we live our lives and conduct our business as we emerge from the restrictions. We may need to take some steps forward and some steps back. But we will not be returning to the world as we knew it before COVID-19 for some time yet. And we were clear at the outset of the crisis that we could not entirely insulate us 
uh, ourselves or our economy. And we have lost loved ones. We have lost neighbours. Our health system has been under tremendous strain. We have lost livelihoods, and some businesses, tragically, will not survive this. We have to consider the impact this dreadful disease has had on families, on communities, the ways we live and the way we socialise, which is why our document sets out very clearly the factors we will take into account in forthcoming reviews of the restrictions and measures that have been taken so far. We will base our judgments on the health and wellbeing impacts of COVID-19, and we will have a clear focus on NHS capacity. We will take account of the impacts which restrictions have on non-COVID health and wellbeing outcomes. We will take account of the societal impacts arising from the restrictions, and we will take account of the impacts the restrictions have for our economy. Now, we know some will want us to set a date for lifting restrictions, but we will not be driven by a timetable, and we know that some will be disappointed by that. Many will want answers immediately around specific scenarios that impact them most directly. But our roadmap would answer every query. It provides an indication which people can use in looking ahead, in anticipating how the next weeks and months might evolve. It is understandable to want as much certainty as possible. And the Executive agreed last week on the need to enhance messaging around what people are already permitted to do within the legal framework, that there is scope for departments to be more clear with different sectors of the economy citing examples such as construction and manufacturing. And it is not surprising that people are erring on the side of caution and not engaging in activities that are in fact permissible, safe and beneficial. This is understandable given the extremely unusual and challenging times we are living through. The executive supported messaging aimed at giving people the knowledge and the confidence to enable them to live their lives as freely as possible within the existing legislative constraints and in line with public health advice. The Department of Health has committed to taking this forward with other departments. Now, I want to stress again before handing over to the Deputy First Minister that our restrictions have worked and they have and are saving lives. We are asking a lot of our people, and we appreciate that the restrictions have health and wellbeing consequences too. We want everyone to be able to go out, visit relatives, socialise and enjoy everything that this place has to offer. We need to get people back to work when safe to do so, and we will get there. It will take time, but we will get there. And I would like to end with a word of thanks for everyone who is working hard to keep us safe including those in our Blue Light Services, the Police Service of Northern Ireland, the Northern Ireland Fire and Rescue Service and the Northern Ireland Ambulance Service, to those who provide our food, look after us in the NHS and who care for the vulnerable. We are grateful. Thank you. Um, just before my remarks, can I just put on record my condemnation of the threats made against members of this Assembly um, over recent days? Those, place, those threats have no uh, place in our society and should be condemned by each and every one of us. Um, we're grateful for the opportunity to come before members today to um, set out the basis of executive decision making and our agreed pathway to recovery. We are, as we all know, in the midst of the biggest challenge of our lifetime. And this invisible killer, uh, this killer virus is causing loss of life and great hardship to many um, people throughout our society, across this island, indeed across this world. So let me start by saying that uh, we do not underestimate the impact of the severe restrictions and the, the impact that's had on everyone right across society. It's fair to say that in general, uh, public support for the unprecedented measures have, that have been introduced have, have held firm throughout recent weeks. There's a public awareness and an understanding that by imposing these essential containment measures, collectively we have slowed down the spread of the virus and we have collectively saved thousands of lives. I want to acknowledge all of those whom, who have lost to, their lives to coronavirus from right across our communities and to send our he heartfelt sympathies to their loved ones from this Assembly Chamber um, today. Just as we went into this crisis, our pathway out of this coronavirus pandemic will require that collective effort and working with the community. We are appealing to the public to please to be patient. We understand that you want your family life back to be able to visit and socialise with your friends and your families, to give your grandchildren a hug. 
We know that you crave more leisure time and being able to get out and about and exercise like you used to. We acknowledge the need for businesses to be able to open and to operate safely so that we can get, all get back to our jobs. We understand that parents want their children to have the educational opportunities they deserve and they thrive on. We accept that many people rely on public transport for work and for socialising. And we totally understand the pressures on the vulnerable who want to be more self-reliant. The restrictions remain in place at this time because it's necessary and because it's working. Our top priority remains saving lives by combating the spread of the virus through staying at home, social distancing and regular hand and body hygiene to kill the spread. Our biggest threat in the fight against COVID-19 still remains complacency. Until a vaccine is found, it means coexisting with the virus and therefore a radical change in how we live our daily lives for some time. Life as we know it has changed. We will have to continue to adjust. Going forward, our whole society will be proactive in targeting risk to reduce the spread of the virus or further outbreaks. And this requires us all to change our behaviour. When we're in a position to slowly and carefully move out of the lockdown, we will keep you updated every step of the way. As we begin to restart community life and reboot the economy to keep people in work and to keep society functioning. While the restrictions are still absolutely necessary, it is important that we give people hope for the future. And today we are setting out our pathway for future recovery, which gives an indication of how the restrictions on different aspects of life may be eased at various stages. So there are three elements which go hand in hand. Firstly, the incremental five-step approach represents the risk evaluation that we will make at each stage in order to restart family, community, educational and economic activity. Secondly, these decisions will be evidenced by medical and scientific advice from our Chief Medical Officer and Chief Scientific Officer. Thirdly, this expert advice and evidence will be benchmarked against guiding principles or criteria and international best practice, including the World Health Organization. We will then make risk-based assessments of the positive and negative effects of the restrictions in place and then decide what to ease and when to ease them. But as we have said before, we will not keep the restrictions in place for a moment longer than they are required. We have built in the necessary flexibility to respond to the complex emergency situation based on all relevant evidence. And we have to be prepared to step forward and step back if this is needed. We must take into account the evidence and the analysis relating to the pandemic. We must take into account the capacity of the health service and social care services to deal with COVID-19, but also the other health and social care services that are needed to look after our people. We must take into account the impacts on our society and our economy, which cannot remain in lockdown indefinitely. And as we go forward, we cannot fight this pandemic blindfolded. Controlling the rate of transmission is absolutely critical. A restriction or requirement should only be relaxed when there is a reasonable prospect of maintaining or at or below one. This means we need to have in place testing, tracking and tracing arrangements to enable us to safely lift the restrictions. Our testing capacity has grown and more sectors have been able to avail of that. But that will be a cornerstone in our ability to lift the restrictions as we move forward. The capacity of our health service to deal with coronavirus is vital. Outbreaks must be minimised in special settings like health facilities and in our care homes. Preventative measures must be in place in workplaces and schools and other places where it is essential for people to go. Importation risks must be managed also. We must ensure that communities are fully educated, engaged and empowered to adjust to the changing way of life as we coexist along with the virus until a vaccine is found. Coronavirus does not respect any politics or borders. And I'm glad to report that there's very good cooperation taking place north-south between executive and Irish government at all levels. The Memorandum of Understanding signed by the executive and the Irish government on the 7th of April is aimed at getting north-south cooperation and coordination right in relation to COVID-19 and the response across the island. Recognising the island as a single epidemiological unit and data and modelling, of course, across the north and south has been undertaken. 
Lash Concordia, these are the most challenging times that any of us can ever remember. It will only be by working together in government and across society that we will minimise the suffering and the hardship caused by this pandemic, tackle the challenges ahead and set about achieving social and economic revival. There will be times when there are strongly held but contrasting views on the right decisions and the right next steps. We as an executive have set out our criteria on how we will apply that to our decision making and we will continue to communicate these with the public and the community. We will also listen very carefully to understand the views and experiences of everyone who has been impacted at this very difficult time. The Executive will continue to put in place measures to help those in need during the lockdown. We have taken steps to help those who are shielding through advice lines and food deliveries. To date, a COVID-19 community helpline has been contacted by over 12,000 people. Access to the food parcels continues to be the main reason for calling the helpline. And over 57,000 food boxes containing essential items have been delivered directly to the door of vulnerable people who cannot access food through online shopping, family, friends or local support networks. We have put in place economic interventions for our business sector. Our schools are providing places uh, for children of key workers and for vulnerable children. The restrictions will be lifted in stages when the timing is right. And it is not in the too distant future. If people continue to adhere to the public advice, which is working, we will be able to remove the restrictions more quickly and restore your freedom, freedoms without further delay. The Executive will continue to work as hard as we can with common purpose. COVID-19 does not discriminate, so we must remain united in a common purpose against the biggest threat facing our community and the world at this time. I want to thank all of our health and emergency responders for, and everyone for continuing to work on our behalf. Working on the front line, their selflessness and courage this time knows no bounds. We will continue to update our, on our thinking, and we are grateful for the opportunity today to provide the Assembly with this update. Thank you. Thank you. And can I thank the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister for coming to the House to make this statement. It was remiss of me, particularly given the two of the members involved are in this chamber, it was remiss of me to overlook, to condemn utterly the threats that have been issued to elected members of this House, whether it is Ms Dillon in Mid-Ulster, uh, Mr Aiken from South Antrim or Mr Beattie from Upper Ban. Uh, and we all stand with you and condemn utterly those who would harass or harangue the democratically elected people, uh, or the democratically elected representatives of the people of Northern Ireland. The first person that I have on my list is the Chair of the Executive Office Committee, Mr Colin McGrath. Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, and I also echo those uh, remarks of condemnation made against the threats uh, against colleagues. Nobody in a democratic society should have to face such threats, and, and nobody should face such threats. Um, I want to start by referencing just quickly the problem in our care home sector. This is fast becoming a care home pandemic, and the owners and staff of homes are doing all that they can with the resources they have, but the virus is continuing to spread. Um, this will need urgent and immediate attention, and I hope that we can get some clarity today on special measures that will need to be taken by the Executive to address this as the emergency that it is. Um, I also want to, to thank the First and Deputy First Minister for providing me with some additional sight to the speech. It was about 10 minutes ahead, and I welcome that, but I suppose maybe if I could ask Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, on behalf of members, that maybe a short recess to allow people to have had time to read the statement would have been good, because there is quite a lot of information in it to be digested in 10 minutes, and, and we will try our best. Um, and the urgency for these remarks is critical because the public is hungry for information, um, because this is about their lives, their livelihoods and their communities um, that have been shut down, isolated, and they all, we all want to know when this will stop. Um, the when is important. Um, I think it would have been useful to have included timescales in this document with the proviso that those could be changed or moved due to circumstances. I think people are very understanding if the times need to change due to medical or scientific evidence, but without time skills, this could be seen as an almost aspirational document, uh, and that may not satisfy the public's thirst uh, for knowing when things might change. People will want as many specifics as possible too. The recycling centres, the parks, the shops, safety at work, uh, schools reopening when the time is right, and of course visiting families and loved ones are all high priorities. And to get a better steer on these things would have been important. 
But as everybody knows, uh, knowing who has and who does not have this virus is critical, and that will take comprehensive testing, tracking and tracing arrangements. Is, can I ask, is that envisaged now as a result of this plan being published today? And can you give us details on how this will happen beyond conversations and modelling between the medical officers north and south? Can you give us the real practical steps that will now take place on an all island basis, given that this virus does not know any borders? Going first, just in terms of. Uh where you started, just in terms of care homes, and I absolutely sorry. I thought you had the statement for an hour beforehand, so apologies for that. Um, what, what, what we want to do, and we're happy to our doors open just to discuss this further, even outside of the chamber today, to yourself as chair of the of the committee. Um, but I think the issue of care homes, we all know that's where the, all the attention needs to be right now. Um, the health minister has described it as that is where the battle uh, currently is. That which means that. Uh, there can be no stone unturned. You need to throw everything but the kitchen sink at making sure every resource that's necessary in the care homes um, is, is put in place. It's one of the things that we discussed yesterday at the executive, and I actually have agreed that there will be a fuller paper coming back around those types of measures. The, what additionality can we bring to put the, the, the effort into the care homes? There's been a lot of you know, um, emphasis and, and improvements in terms of support for care homes, which I think the members also registered himself in terms of financial support and trying to transfer staff in and those things are all crucially important but we have to keep asking ourselves every day are we doing enough is there enough being done um, and I think that for me certainly uh, one of the things that's going to be really crucial to, to us being able to advance and support care homes more is actually get to the point of universal testing and that's a point that I have made so when we have a care home where there is an outbreak there should be a rolling program of, of testing that allows you to be able to monitor that situation very carefully um, we, we, don't want to be, we don't want to be sitting at any stage of this and, and regretting that we, we didn't do enough. So the test, trace and isolate policy is crucial to, us, to, to all of that as well, as, as you know. Um, and we have to get to the point where, um, where there's capacity to test in a universal way in care homes. That's certainly uh, the conversation that we're having. So on, at the executive on Thursday, we expect to have a further conversation around this, around how you can build on the additional finances, the resource in terms of of people, we need proper PPE for all our staff in our care homes. You know, all these things need to be looked at in the round. And um, the, the other thing, as I said, is that there's going to be, and it's in the document, that there'll be an urgent expansion and intensive programme of testing for residents and staff in care homes, and that's going to commence immediately. So that's a good, a, a good thing. Um, the light at the end of the tunnel, and I get that because we all, we all have families. We're, we're all in the same boat, um, and everybody wants to be able to have something to look forward to. And we looked very carefully at the whole, as a whole executive, we looked carefully at the issue of putting timelines to um, and specific dates to certain um, areas. And we decided against that for the reason that people want light at the end of the tunnel. We don't want to build up expectation and then you have to move because all of this is dependent on our R rate being at a, at, a, at a lower level. So clearly at this moment in time, with the R rate sitting somewhere around 0 0.8 and 0 0.9, we're not in a space where we can comfortably move to do um, anything. However, to give people an idea of indication of time, we've said that um, every three weeks we'll review the regulations. That, so the next date for that review it has to happen by the 28th of May. Um, however, we have built in enough flexibility into this programme that if the Chief Medical Officer and the Chief Scientific Officer was to sit down tomorrow with the Executive and say we are now at 0.5, for example, on the reproductive rate, then that would allow us the space to move in advance of the three weeks. So just to give people an indication, we could potentially be in a space where, if you look at the document where it talks about um, the different stages, the five-stage approach, um, you could be in very quickly at step one in, in the document, I think, which would give people an indication that we're only perhaps provided that, that the disease keeps going on a downward trajectory and the R rate keeps coming down, that we could be in that space in, a very, in the very immediate future. So hopefully that gives people an indication of time. Um, but I do think the flexibility that we've built into this um, allows, uh, gives us the, the ability to move as we see fit. Um, so hopefully that gives people an understanding just around that. It's, it's just about trying not to build up expectation. Um, it's about saying, so here's the five steps, here's the guide, here are the types of things that are included in that. Um, and I think that it's important that, that we highlight to people things that perhaps can happen in each step and, and in the time frame that we're talking about. Uh, just on a point of housekeeping, um, the ministerial statement landed in the Speaker's office at seven minutes past the hour 
and we reconvened at 37 minutes past the hour, so they were within the accepted uh, time frame for the statement. Uh, I give the Chair of the Executive Office Committee some leeway because he's the Chair of the Executive Office Committee, but the questions are going to have to be much more focused than that. I have, four, I have 20 people asking questions, and we're seven minutes into an hour allocation. Does the Chair want to ask a supplementary? And, uh, just to ask for clarification, in terms of the document, one of the things that could be seen is the different phases. Um, are we the, the heading for current position, is that where we are today under all of those headlines? We're not moving today to phase one. It will be three weeks before we, re we review moving from the current phase to phase one. Thanks, uh, Colm. And can I say to you that there's no silver bullet and there's no flick of a switch. We have to do this in a stage-by-stage -stage process. And taking that into account, what you see in the document today, it says the current position in all of the, t the boxes is where we are today. Uh, we will continuously look to see if we can move to stage one in relation to the different boxes. And as Michelle says, we have built in that flexibility to move whenever the advice comes to us. I think that is a better way of doing this. I understand the desire for dates. Believe me, I understand that. But we had to balance up putting down dates uh, and then not having the flexibility to move uh, in a different way. And that's why um, we put that in. I do want to also say, though, we will give notice uh, to thinking about businesses in particular. If we're saying that they can reopen again, obviously they will need time to get ready. Uh, and that's what this plan is about as well, to give them an indication of, of the movement. Um, you asked a very specific question in relation to uh, track and trace, which um, I just want to pick up. Um, contact tracing, of course, is very important to us moving forward. Um, and uh, the contact tracing service NI is very well advanced. Uh, on the 27th of April, a pilot phase of contact tracing begun to permit testing and further development of the system and processes. And uh, the process is evolving, and we're learning from that pilot. Uh, and a transition phase following on from the pilot commenced uh, just yesterday on the 11th of May. So we are preparing and developing uh, the delivery of phase two uh, on the project, and we hope to uh, implement that next week on the, on the 18th of May. So the contact tracing is, is key to us moving uh, ahead in our steps, and I, I really do want to make that point. It's part of what we're uh, planning for. Uh, and whilst uh, you may say that some will see this as an aspirational document. I have to say I do think it is very clear on, on what we're relying on for decision making. So if you look at the, the document, it, it, it is very clear that we're looking at evidence and analysis. We're looking at the capacity of our health service, and then we're looking at an assessment on a risk assessment, uh, basically of the impact on health, on the economy, and indeed on, on society. Because we do realise that these restrictions are having a big impact on family life and on people meeting their friends, and that has an impact on your mental health. And we recognise that, and we do want to challenge that uh, and to make it part of our risk assessment. I call Ms. Paula Bradley. Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, and can I fa thank the First Minister and Deputy First Minister um, for their statement here today, and also the document um, we received. Um, and I mean, I think we we all just want life to be back to normal. I can't wait. To, I hug my little grandson and uh, my mum and dad and my family. So I, I, I'm looking forward to that. But I do understand we need to be measured in our approach going forward. And I know, um, First Minister, you had mentioned that the uh, Economy Minister is going to bring more detail to do with economic recovery. But could I ask you um, if you could further expand on that some plans that we have for economic recovery? Yeah. So when we say uh, we're planning for the future, of course, we're making sure that health is to the fore and that we take into account the impact uh, on the R number, which Michelle has referred to, and to make sure that we move forward on a step-by-step -step basis. But we're also conscious of just what you've referenced about hugging your grandchild, about the society point, and the economic issue. Because COVID-19 has had, and if the economy minister was here, she would say, a devastating impact on the Northern Ireland economy. So, we have to look at how we mitigate that impact and then how we plan for recovery in terms of uh, how we move forward. So she will be bringing plans on the recovery element of that in the very near future. That will sit alongside uh, our roadmap. 
And also, uh, I think the very good work of the Northern Ireland Engagement Forum should be remembered. Something that we did here, which was unique to Northern Ireland, was to set up that forum between employers and between trade unions, between the Health and Safety Executive, Diane's own apartment, department. Uh, they produced a very good piece of work about how you could work safely. And I think that guidance should be read in accordance with going back to work. Uh, and then uh, just today, I think, or, or late last night, the Department of Business uh, on the mainland has brought forward guidance about safe working as well. So all of that has to be read in conjunction with the roadmap that we're bringing forward today. Thomas Bradley for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the First Minister for her answer. Just following on from that, we know that there have been many companies um, over the last seven, eight weeks, as, as well as communities, um, that have uh, helped in the fight against COVID-19. So just for your assessment, and that, I, don't, I don't think that we, that maybe we in Northern Ireland are aware of just how many people have continued through this crisis to work hard um, to deliver for, for communities and for our health service. The Deputy First Minister may want to recount uh, visiting some of the firms that have been involved in repurposing to actually deliver uh, PPE, for example. There are many firms doing that. Uh, and there are many firms who have employees who are furloughed and they're out helping in the community, delivering food and doing uh, all of those deliveries. Uh, so I think we should be very proud of the fact that so many of our firms have actually not uh, just said, right, we're on furlough, we're not going to do anything. They've actually repurposed to provide uh, PPE and, as I say, other assistance to the community. So we are very proud of those firms, uh, and I do want to send a message of thanks to them from this chamber today. Yeah. Just add to that, I mean, and I have visited like Block Blinds and other companies like that that have actually repurposed. And I think there's a lesson for everybody for the future. You know, we potentially could be facing a second wave of this. Or, or, or another pandemic of some kind. So I think that there's a lesson to be learned and we need to be self-sufficient. So our companies that have actually repurposed, that perhaps there's a future for them in, in continuing to produce to make sure that we have sufficient levels of PPE if and when we ever required them uh, again. So I think that um, all credit to those companies that actually, you know, we're in a very bad place having to furlough their workers and anxious, but then very quickly just turned it around to be able to help the health service and actually keep people in employment alongside that. So, I mean, they're just only good news stories out of that and, and as I said all credit to those companies but for me there's something in that around you know how do we make sure we're sufficient in the things that we may need in a crisis in the future and making sure that we have supply chains here that actually can, can deliver for us. I call Mr Colin Gildernew. I want to thank the ministers for the statement they have made here today and also to welcome the, the amount of work that has gone into this and the amount of thought that has gone into this. And I think um, I would welcome the fact that this is based solely on the evidence that is being presented at any given time. And I don't think that is actually aspirational. And I think that's, that's quite sensible. This virus is no more a respecter of calendars than it is of borders. And I think that approach is, is the right approach to take. That does raise questions about having the capacity to, to test and trace to, to provide the evidence, which, which will need to be dealt with quite speedily. Um, I too would be concerned about the care home sector, and the question has been largely answered in relation to Mr McGrath's question, but that sector does need urgent attention. I would like, however, my question today is in relation to what is referenced in the document here, that communities must be engaged, educated and empowered to, uh, to deal with the issues that we move out of. And I would like to raise the issue today of some of our harder to reach communities. I am very saddened to hear in recent days of the death of a foreign national worker in Dungannon, some of our most, most valuable workers. However, sectors, and we know from, from testing in the south of Ireland that there are particular clusters emerging within food processing sectors, largely due to the fact that those are often worked, uh, worked by people who are living in higher multiple, multiple occupancy housing. They have language issues and there are, there are particular supports they need. So I would ask that, that you work with the public health agency who I have raised this with to ensure that those very harder to reach communities are, are reached out to and engaged with on an ongoing basis at this time. I thank the uh, Chair of the Health Committee for raising this very important issue. And of course, we do send our sympathy uh, to the family of Mr Silva. And, um, 
were very, I was very shocked to hear that it had happened in Dungannon and to see that she had lost her life in that way. And I think he makes a very good point about how we reach out to those who maybe don't have English as their first language. Maybe it's something that we could look at in terms of our summary document and communications maybe um, in different languages going out to, and we know there are many languages in Dungannon um, and, uh, and in Portadown and places like that. It is important uh, that we are able to communicate with everybody living here in Northern Ireland. It's one of the, the reasons why Michelle and I very early on wanted to have our um, signers with us at all of our press conference and we've been able to reach out to the deaf community in a very real way by doing that. Um, in terms of our care homes, um, this is where the health minister and indeed the whole executive is very focused uh, at this present moment in time. Uh, we have asked the health minister to bring forward uh, another paper, a comprehensive paper as to what is actually happening in our care homes around testing, around staffing levels, and we do understand that uh, thousands of hours of uh, staff hours are now going into the private sector nursing homes to try and assist. Um, there's new guidance out in relation uh, to COVID-19. We know that some, uh, most of our uh, care homes do not have COVID-19, and that's how we make sure that COVID-19 doesn't get into those homes. So there's a, there's a whole strategy around our care homes now, and look, we, we accept um, that these are our most precious and vulnerable residents, and we want to make sure that we do all that we can. And as Michelle says, when we look back, we will not say we should have done something else at that particular point in time. So, look, we are very much engaged in relation to the care home. The whole executive is very engaged on this issue. And just, just to add to that, um, again, to Mr Silva's family, obviously sent our condolences. And... And to say this very clearly to anybody out there, um, obviously there will have to be a full investigation into what happened in her own um, circumstance, and I would encourage that between both the, the employer and the HSE. But I would say this very clearly to all workers out there, nobody should be working in unsafe practice. And there's been very good work done in terms of developing guidance with um, the Labour Relations Agency, working with the trade unions, working with uh, employers to, to make sure that the guidance is very solid and in place and very understandable. And it needs to be translated into actual work practices. So no one should be going to work in any way compromised in their own health because um, of things not being put in place. I'm not saying that's the case there. I don't know. Um, but there needs to be an investigation. But in terms of workers in general, workers need to be protected. There's guidance there. And that needs to be adhered to. And I would encourage anyone that has concerns about their workplace, and they need to bring that forward to the HSE. That is their job. That is, that is their remit to investigate those complaints. Your points are well made in terms of the nursing home. There's not one person in this chamber that doesn't share the, the concern and, and the anxiety about making sure that everything's done to support um, our nursing homes. And that's why it's important that, in addition to what has been announced around the funding and the other issues which um, Arlene has touched on there, is that we actually are, the executives confirmed the Department of Health will implement an urgent expansion and intensive programme of testing for residents and staff in care homes. And that expansion is expected to commence immediately. That's in addition. And, and then what we intend to do on Thursday is, again, look again, what else? What else can be done to make sure that we do everything that needs um, to be done? Mr. Golden, you, you happy enough? Short supplementary. Go on ahead. Um, as part of that consideration to what else could be done, could I ask the, the First and Deputy First Minister to consider the discharge uh, policies from hospitals at the present time um, to see if there's more can be done there to prevent people who are potentially either tested positive for COVID-19 or awaiting the results of a test that a uh, discharge could be delayed to provide a breathing space for the care homes. Yes, happy to take that on board and we'll, we'll incorporate it into the, into the conversation. And I think the current policy is that uh, Everyone will be tested, but perhaps delay, discharges aren't delayed as a result of waiting for the result. Um, but we're happy to pick that up, surely. Commissioner Steve Aiken. Thank you very much, indeed, uh, Mr. Deputy Principal Speaker. And just before I start my remarks, I would like to say that attacks on anybody, not just MLAs, but journalists as well, fundamentally undermines the principles of democracy in Northern Ireland and everywhere else in the world and should be rightly condemned. But thank you very much indeed for your remarks. Deputy Principal Speakers and Deputy First Minister, Deputy First Minister. Uh, indeed, may I thank the First Minister and Deputy First Minister for your joint statement today. We in the UUP join with you and in the words of thanks indeed for the support for our vital and key workers, especially those in the Blue Light Services, the NHS and our social care staff. And I appreciate it cannot be easy to be part of a five-party executive. <laughs> you can smile and laugh. But today it is good to see growing sense of cohesion. 
And I think it's a cohesion that everybody in Northern Ireland wants to see, and I think that is echoed by everybody in this Assembly who wants to see that cohesion continue to grow. The Ulster Union Party has been, for many weeks, we've been calling for a recovery plan, and this is indeed a start. And we welcome the paper that uh, we welcome in your remarks as well that the Economy Minister is working on the, a new paper on the economy, and we cannot see that soon enough. The question I would specifically like to the First Minister and Deputy First Minister is, first of all, on what date are we likely to see that economy plan? And will that plan address the concerns of the many companies that are indeed right now fighting for survival? And in particular, will you give a commitment to talk to the Finance Minister to make sure that the money that's been held centrally is used now to support our businesses so we still have an economy to pull ourselves out of in the autumn? Thank you. Well, well, just to state the obvious, uh, five parties working together around the executive table is always going to throw up challenges. And we have to, we're all adults, we'll have disagreements, we'll have different takes on things, we'll have different emphasis at different times. Um, but our job is to try and work our way through it as best we can. And I think we've been able to do that um, over this um, crisis that we face as a society because none of us escaped it. It's, it's, it's impacting on, on us all. So I think that the, um, in terms of the plan that's been put forward today, I mean, this is the, this is the five parties working together. This is us trying to present a, a way forward. And it's about us taking the best approach which we think suits um, the, our, our local um, population. And it's about um, trying to give people that light at the end of the tunnel, that there is a way forward here. We soon get back to some semblance of normality. Because as I said in my initial comments, um, life as we know it beforehand isn't going to be the same again. That being said, we're, we're very adaptable people. I have no doubt that we'll be able to adapt, but our job will be to try and um, limit the spread of the disease. That's why the social distancing is going to be with us um, for some uh, time to come. We, as an executive, have been solely focused initially, obviously, on the public health crisis, saving lives. And then, of course, we have had to turn our minds to the recovery. What does that look like? What does recovery and renewal look like? And when you look at some of the, you know, the, 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 the assessments around the local economy and the damage this is doing to the, to the economy right now, um, you would only rightly be concerned about how we're going to build um, our way out of that. One of the initial assessments put forward talks about how the economy um, would, would be at a 25 to 30 percent below normal rate of growth. So that, that shows you the, the size of the challenge which we have ahead of us. So we have been working our way through um, what does economic recovery look like, um, albeit within the executive, because we want to be only focused on the public health message. So uh, we will continue to work uh, as a collective executive. Um, we don't have an unlimited pot of funding, as you also know, um, and we have to make very wise choices about how we use the funding that we have. Um, and, and I think that's important that we come at those things together. We won't be able to do all the things that we would want to do. Um, that's to be very upfront with people, um, but we'll do our very best uh, with, with people and we'll do our very best to work together across the executive on identifying what are the priorities? And that all comes from um, identifying your plan, here's how we're going to recover, and then trying to fund that as best we can. Mr. Aiken, for a supplementary. And thank you very much indeed for the First Minister and Deputy First Minister's uh, uh, answers there. One of the issues we've talked about is dealing on the island and an all-island basis when it comes to dealing with the pandemic. But one of the issues, particularly when we're looking at the recovery, is there's uh, initiatives now being taken in the Irish Republic that are likely to severely impact against our transportation sectors and our hospitality sectors, particularly in relation to areas of VAT and VAT reduction in those areas as well. Will the First Minister and Deputy First Minister make a commitment to talk directly to the Westminster Government about making approaches, particularly around APD and VAT reduction, so that our economy, when it does come out, is at least able to compete on a level playing field? Thank you. So I thank the member for that question and indeed just to reflect on the fact that um, because of our membership of the UK we have been the beneficiaries of quite significant uh, economic schemes. I, I think he will acknowledge that. Um, in terms of the furloughing scheme, we wait to hear what the Chancellor has to say today in relation to the tapering of furloughing. I think that's critical because there are certain sectors, even by our step-by-step -step plan, who will not be uh, out of lockdown uh, by the end of June, and that, of course, is when the furlough uh, scheme is due to come to an end. I hope that we will see today a tapering of that scheme um, so that uh, our businesses will be able to benefit, continue to benefit 
uh, from that scheme. I think that is uh, very important. Uh, of course, we have intervened as well in a, in a number of ways with our £10,000 scheme, our £25,000 scheme, the hardship scheme uh, that is about to come online. Uh, there's more that we're looking at in terms of rates, uh, and we will come to the House uh, around that very soon. Uh, you asked a specific question about Diane's paper. I hope that that will be out within the next week um, so that we can dovetail that in uh, with this roadmap that we have. And of course, if there are developments in the Republic of Ireland, we will want to take those up uh, with our own government to say that you know, we will, if we're at a competitive disadvantage, how do we address that and how do we help our uh, businesses and particular sectors to overcome that? Because there are some sectors, uh, and I know the member recognises this, uh, who will really struggle really struggle. And the sad truth is some businesses will not survive. And uh, I think it's right that we're honest about that. But what we have to do is to try and make sure the maximum number of businesses survive. Uh, and that has always been what has been driving uh, the executive in terms of their, their economic in, uh, interventions uh, when they're put alongside uh, the Westminster government interventions. Folks, before I call the next uh, person on the list, we're 27 minutes in. Now, I, I like give some leeway because the four first people on my list are all chairs of committees. Short, focused questions, short, focused answers, and everyone will get their speak in. Uh, I call Ms Kelly Armstrong. Thank you very much, Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, I'm just joining with others to say that absolutely the condemnation on those who have given threats, but also today to say to the First Ministers, thank you. This is not the worst document in the world. I think compared to the other um, nations, this is a document that the community can look at. But as you can imagine, people will automatically say, when will we go to stage one? There will be people today who will be asking that question. We're not going to give them dates. There's no point. You have said that. We will do it when it's safe to do so. But there will be a number and a group of people concerned. If we are starting to go back to work, what about childcare? What about education? We can't go to work unless our kids are looked after. Uh, what can you give as support and hope for those people today? If you, um, thanks for your, for your comments, and uh, we'll try our best to try and produce something that is. We wanted to produce a very user-friendly document that people could actually just uh, take away and, and look at themselves. But I absolutely understand the, the people, the desire to want to have a date. I want to have a date. I wish I could say on X date this is what's going to happen. Unfortunately, because of it's dependent on the science and dependent on the disease spread, we have to be very careful about that. But I think we can give people indications. You know, so the first category talks about this is where we are today. We hope to be able to keep this under review. And at the very outset, uh, you know, the 28th of May is the next review date. But I don't think, if, if, if two couple of things to say, if people continue to comply with the regulations um, and stay at home, because that's our message, um, if people continue to comply with the regulations and if, if the R rate comes down, then we'll be in a position much quicker to be able to move. And we won't hold on for one day longer. If it means that we do this every day, we review this every day, that's what we intend to do because we don't want to be in a position where um, we're holding on to uh, very uh, stringent measures for, for one day longer than necessary, so just to give you that assurance. On the issue of education and schools, again, in my opening comments, I talked about you know, parents' desire to want to have their children in school, and, and we understand all of that. I think, realistically, the, the, that the, the situation will be in schools that it will be in September before, um, before that's moved before schools are opened again in, in, it, in their normal fashion. Even at that, not in their normal fashion, because we'll have to look at how that's done. And the Education Minister will be speaking with the trade union movement as well, because we need to look at um, how are we going to manage that. So what, does, what can parents expect to see in September or when schools start um, again? And I think that there's going to be very careful planning need to be done around all of that. Very confusing picture for children themselves first going back into school and maybe those who are transitioning from P7 into first year or, um, or any of those sort of, anybody who was supposed to be doing exams, all those things are all just now in the mix and it's quite um, confusing for people. Um, on the issue of, uh, but sorry, the Education Minister will come forward and give more detail of that in, in due course. Um, on, on, the, on the issue of childcare, um, again, that's going to be one of the most challenging pieces about how we move forward and um, obviously, a lot of workers have been furloughed right now, but when that scheme comes to an end, how do you manage that? How are they going to be able to survive? So these are big challenges for us. I don't have all the answers to that, to that question as I stand here today, but certainly this is a challenge which we're going to have to work our way through. If we're going to be able to allow people who, who are able to go um, to work because they can't work at home, how can we support them in terms of the childcare sector? 
Ms Armstrong for a supplementary. Well, Deputy Speaker, thank you very much to the Minister for, for her answer. Um, just thinking about when we come out of this mental health, um, we have lots of grieving families, and I'm so sorry for anyone who's lost anyone during this terrible time, um, who have not been able to grieve properly. We have um, a lot of our frontline health workers who are seeing the cold face and the deaths that have been happening. There's a lot of people who have lived in isolation, widows, for instance, living at home, single parents. Um, what mm. will we be able to do to support our society coming out of this? Um, because as we know, we're not going back to normal. It won't be flick a switch today and stage one starts. It'll be progression. But how can we support the mental health of our society and those who are struggling so much at the moment? I thank the member for that very relevant question because I think when we think of mental health it sometimes conjures up an idea in our head but she's right to mention the elderly in this context because I think a lot of elderly people are really struggling at the moment um, in terms of the isolation, uh, in terms of their family not calling in, uh, not being able to go uh, to some of their meetings and, and what have you, and, and they really are struggling at this present moment in time. So there, there is a very specific piece of work around elderly uh, people and their mental health, and I hope that we will be able to do more in relation to that. But of course, the mental health issue, whether it's for NHS workers, and there's been a real concern uh, expressed about that issue, uh, and the term post-traumatic stress has been mentioned in, in that context, uh, and of course our young people who before this all came upon us, we were very concerned about, and actually we set up uh, a new uh, and improved uh, subcommittee of the executive to try and look at well-being and resilience as opposed to dealing with the aftermath. Um, and so it is something we are very focused on, and the health minister has appointed a mental health champion, or is it in the process of appointing a mental health champion. He brought a paper to the executive to seek our uh, agreement on that, and we, of course, were fully in agreement with that. It's something that will sit across the executive. We hope that champion will be able to help identify the pinch points in relation to all these issues, but my goodness, we are very alert to the fact that it will be a huge job of work. Mr Gary Middleton. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the First and Deputy First Minister for the document. Uh, it's only been re released an hour, and already there are questions around the detail and the need for indicative timings and uh, to allow for businesses to effectively plan. Uh, how would you respond uh, to those people who are already raising concerns just about the detail in the document? Well, you know, we, we expected that to happen, Gary, and I, I suppose what we've tried to do uh, is to give examples of work, retail, education, uh, travel, what will happen in families, sport and culture, and then to give indicative uh, pieces around moving to step one, step two. Uh, I think we have set out the current position, uh, and Michelle has already articulated the fact that if we are given the advice sooner than the 20th of May, we will move sooner than the 20th of May, because uh, part of looking at the regulations is very much the necessity of the regulations and whether they are proportionate. In other words, uh, do we need them or are they doing more harm than good? So we will have to look at all of those things. Uh, and I think we've set out in the document, uh, at the front of the document, the, the actual decision-making process. And the, the good thing not that I'm saying it's not a good thing for the executive to be meeting so often, of course. Uh, the good thing about the executive meeting uh, on so frequent a basis is that we can review this on an ongoing basis. And I hope that this will be very much a living document and that we can come back and talk about it and we can communicate with people. And part of the document uh, and I, is about the partnership approach uh, with the community out there. We are telling them what we are going to do, and I hope that they are going to respond in a positive way as well, because compliance is key. If people comply, then we are able to move in a faster way, and that's the reality of it. It's a very simple thing, but it's actually the reality of it. And we know that there's been fraying around the edges in relation to compliance, and what we're saying to is keep the faith, be patient, and we'll be able to move to step one. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the First Minister for her response. Uh, obviously, the fact that uh, each jurisdiction, each devolved administration, has taken their own uh, plan based on their own needs. Uh, how would you respond, First Minister, in terms of those who would say that the United Kingdom is very much disunited in terms of how we're dealing with these issues? 
Well, I don't see it like that. I, I see it as a devolved reaction, and I think, to be fair, the Prime Minister sees it as that as well, even though there's been a lot of noise around this issue. Uh, we are working, and as I've already referenced, in a UK framework around some of our economic interventions. Uh, therefore, they will have an impact on what's going on. But it is important that we have a localised response to what is going on here in Northern Ireland. I think that is very key and very critical uh, for us, and I don't see that as being a threat uh, to the United Kingdom at all. In fact, I see it as actually actually devolution working in practice right across the UK. Mr. Pat Sheehan. I welcome the focus the strategy places on tracing, testing and isolation. The World Health Organization has advised consistently that every single suspected case should be tested and all possible contacts traced. Uh, can the Minister outline how this can be taken forward in an effective way, given the limitations that there have been on testing and tracing, which has meant that not every single suspect case has been tested? Uh, thanks to the member again for the question. I think that the, there's a recognition now um, right across the executive that, we, um, that the cornerstone of um, our recovery is actually having a fully fledged test, trace and isolate policy and that it's up and, up and running. I think that um, everybody can note that there has been improvements in, in terms of the capability to test. It's not where it should be yet, um, but, but there are um, improvements um, nonetheless. There's now just, I think it's just over 2,000 um, people that can be capability to test, over two, just over 2,000 um, per day now. But we're also told um, yesterday that um, that's going to be ramped up to an additional 1,000 a day. Uh, because of the AFP testing coming online, which um, unfortunately uh, we thought it would have been online before now, but hasn't. But that's going to give an, an another additional 1,000 per day. And then alongside that, there's also addition, additional testing coming forward in the form of about another 500. So that's 1,500 tests per day to increase from the 2,000 that are, that are currently there. That's obviously a far improved um, picture, but there's a way to go because the, the, the linchpin in all of this that's going to carry us through all of this is having the, those three things working in tandem. So I welcome the fact that there has been um, improvements in the capability to test, but recognise there's a way to go. On the tracing, I welcome the fact that the pilot programme is up and running and that we'll see further advancements on that on the 18th, um, which is just next week. And then, you know, it's about the isolation then and how do you look after those people that need to be isolated as a result of, of all of that work. But that is, that, that is what we're going to be um, wax and lyrical about, if you like, in, in, in the weeks ahead as we move our way through this, because this is going to be the key to get us to be able to re relax the measures and, and to move forward as quickly as, as we can, because the more we can test, trace and isolate, then the, 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 the ability for us to be able to get the OR factor down, get the transmission down and, and reduce uh, the restrictions. Mr. Uh, I, I acknowledge what the, uh, the Deputy First Minister and indeed the First Minister uh, said earlier on about the pilot scheme for tracing uh, and that that's going to be ramped up. And those countries that have been most successful in combating the virus have followed the testing and tracing uh, isolating model. However, we're starting from a very low base indeed. And I wonder, is the Minister confident that the testing and tracing can be ramped up to an extent that will allow us to ease the restrictions in the foreseeable future? Good. I'm confident that uh, we'll make sure that it does. Um, this is an essential part of the recovery, and if we don't get this right, then we can't lift the restrictions. So it's part and parcel of the plan and the, the way out of this and the exit. So it has to be done. There's a number of things that are being developed. There's conversation around this app, what that looks like in terms of assisting the way forward. I've certainly got a view, and I believe this is the view of the Health Minister as well, that um, any app needs to be decentralised. It needs to, people to hold their own information as opposed to going centrally. Um, and those things are all being developed. So I think this is, this is absolutely where, where the focus has to be in terms of being able to get this policy right and have it fully functioning. And it is key to the recovery. Call Mrs. Pam Cameron. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and uh, thank the uh, First and Deputy First Ministers for their statement to the House um, this morning. And uh, I do very much welcome uh, the, uh, the news that there will be a more comprehensive paper coming back to the Executive on our care homes, because we're all incredibly worried about um, what's going on there and uh, protecting 
um, those that are most vulnerable in society. Could I ask in terms of the, the, the statement um, that uh, could the First or Deputy First Minister um, tell us what the um, role will be of the Joint Biosecurity Centre? Uh, what, um, what role will that play? Well, the Joint Biosecurity Centre um, was raised with us at COBRA uh, on Sunday, and really the idea behind that is that we will have the expertise in the centre um, that will then look at all of the devolved regions, uh, and so if there is a localised outbreak, that then we can take a localised action. So that's why I say that there is a recognition um, in the UK that there may need to be localised interventions, and I really welcome the Joint Biosecurity Centre, uh, which has been announced by the Prime Minister. They will work in conjunction with the Chief Medical Advisers in the devolved regions to make sure that we have the best information possible to us, because you know, I think sometimes what people forget is this is novel coronavirus, so it's new. We're, we're learning all the time uh, about the impact, how we control it, uh, how many people will be immune uh, if they catch it and survive. You know, all of these things have to be explored, including, obviously, most importantly, the vaccine. Um, so the Joint Biosecurity Centre will be very much involved in all of that. Thank you. Thank the First Minister for uh, her response. Um, can I ask then, just to follow up, do you envisage that when the Prime Minister refers to um, taking action to deal with community spikes, it, that he means that there could be different restrictions in different parts of England? Um, yes, I think possibly. Um, the whole idea behind the centre is that they will have more of a granular look at the infection in, in various places around the UK. And uh, I mean, obviously, England's a, a large country, and there may be a difference, as indeed there are, is in terms of the R number in England. So parts of England are different from other parts of England. So if you look at the east of England, it is a higher R than London, for example, which is a lower R because they're ahead in terms of the infection and the transmission of the virus. So they're down about 0.5 now, whereas the east of England is, is uh, around the same as we are here in Northern Ireland. So. There are differences, uh, and therefore the need to be able to react to that and to have a localised response, I think, is very important. Call Mrs. Martina Anderson. And I actually find that the information you released today and the statements that you've made are very clear. Uh, it seems to me there's five stages, and we're going to move through each of those stages when it's safe to do so. And I think it's worth reminding everyone who's clamouring for information, more information uh, about what you said in relation to this pandemic, it's still there and it's as deadly today as it was uh, during lockdown. So given the five stages that you talked about, could you outline what are the guiding principles that is going to ensure that we walk through these five stages uh, when it's safe to do so? Thanks uh, for the question, and I suppose it was remiss of us not to say this is International Day of the Nurse, so it, it would be important to put on record our thanks um, to all those nurses out there that are working uh, on our behalf right now in what is the most difficult of circumstances, so thank you to, to all of them on our, on our behalf. Um, in terms of the, the, the thanks for your commentary around um, it being clear, and, it, and it isn't, like, it's just only natural that people have a desire to, to get all the information. And, the one concrete information, and I, I absolutely understand it. Um, so I think that it's important that people um, understand that we are guided by the science, but here's what it looks like in each sort of stage as we move forward. So one of the things I think, you know, when it comes to uh, family, for example, and community, because the question that the number of people have asked, Paula asked about hugging our grandchild, you know, that's, that's really, really, people want to know when that can happen. And um, we want to be able to give that assurance as quickly as possible. So if I was to point people to the, the, the stages, I would say that when it comes to family and community, we're looking at in the first phase, which if everybody's compliant and we get the R rate down, we could be there very quickly. Um, and I think it's important then to say that whenever we get to that point, groups of four to six people who don't share a household can meet outside if you can socially distance. But then alongside that, that actually families um, with the exception of those people that are shielding, obviously, because they have to be protected throughout all of this. But outside of that, um, families are able to visit with your immediate family indoors, um, provided that you, you can socially distance. So it at least brings you closer together. If, if, you know, so we're, it's, it's that process, I think, that people are trying to get their head around, and, and we'll try to keep communicating this as best as we can. As Arlene said earlier, it's not, we're not going to do um, 
surprise to some people. We'll be telling people that we're looking at these things and that we hope to be able to make a decision and we will move as quickly as we can. The guiding um, things to take us through this is the evidence, so science-led. It's about the capacity of the health service to be able to respond. And it's about that we have the transmission, because this is what, what the WHO guidelines say, that the success of any exit strategy has to be you have your transmission under control, you've got capacity in your health service, that, um, and that includes your ability to test, um, trace and isolate, that you have your outbreaks um, minimised in, in special settings, including, including in our care homes, that you've got preventative work measures in your workplaces and um, in your schools and other places where it's essential for people to go, that you've got your importation risks, um, that they can be managed, and that, that you communicate all of this to the public and that people are engaged about the new sort of life as we know it in terms of being able to socially distance and try to prevent virus spread. So those are the things that are going to guide us. So that gives you your clear guidance and then we work our way through this um, as, in as quick a way as we can, but all the while public safety, saving lives being the number one priority. So that's why we have to be guided by the science. Uh, for, for that uh, response and that answer. And I think the reference that you made being today being International Nursing Day, um, I think it's very appropriate that the statement's being made today and the information is out on this day. And with that in mind, uh, can I ask you in relation to nurses who at one time were in strike and now we're showing a deep appreciation, but also for domiciliary nursing as well, and giving the, the kind of pay scale that those nurses are on, or those care workers are on, it would be good to send a signal to them that the appreciation um, is also not just acknowledging what they are doing, but to take into account the kind of salaries that they, they receive, unfortunately, at, very, at the lower scale um, of what others receive. I think that's a really valid point and I think we're all having conversations now about the kind of society we want to see at the other side of this and the fact that the people that we've depended on most are the, predominantly a female workforce, predominantly the lowest paid workforce and, and um, I think it's important that we have conversations about the type of society we live in on, on the other side of this and how we value those people that we rely on so much right now. Um, so I think that that's a conversation that in terms of the rebuilding from here, where do we go next and how do we... Uh, use any resources that we have as best that we can and also how do we value our health service because the health service is what uh, we were depending on to get us through this right now as well and I think that you know when you look at years of, of cuts and years of, uh, of austerity and the impact that's had on our health service um, I think that we have big big building to do on the other side of this because we had a health service going into this that was a breaking point and we certainly will have a, a more challenging picture on the other side of this. Call Mr. Matthew Toole. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, thank you to First and Deputy First Minister for coming and giving us the presentation today. Um, I first of all echo actually what the um, Deputy First Minister and Martina Anderson said about International Nurses Day. Um, I think we've all been reminded of how uh, amazing a job nurses do. My own mum is um, started training as a nurse 50 years ago in the Royal, and I haven't been able to see her in about two months. So, uh, like like everyone else who's been a nurse, I'd be um, remiss if I didn't mark that. Um, I take the point that it's important that we don't get stuck on dates. As a former civil servant, I understand the importance of building in flexibility in the document, so you can change your mind later on. I am, however, reminded of the phrase that there's light at the end of the tunnel, but there's no tunnel. This document talks about the interaction of the R rate uh, with other factors, including contact tracing. Can one of you give me a sense of how that interaction works in terms of contact tracing? Are there a specific number of contact tracers we need to have in Northern Ireland in order, to, you know, in order to, to release certain restrictions, if the R rate is going down from 8 to, for example, 7, but there are a certain number of contact tracers, does that mean we can ease restrictions? It would be helpful to have a bit more clarity on that. Yes, well, I hope uh, the member will accept that this is a tunnel, <laughs> and this is a tunnel for moving uh, out. Uh, he's right to, to ask the question about the number of contact tracers you need uh, depending on where we are with the R. And I am sorry, I don't have that figure with me, uh, but I'm sure when the Health Minister comes to the Chamber on Thursday, he will have that uh, number. But he's right, that's what we need to look at because we will need to be able to trace uh, the virus in the community. And the only way to do that is to have contact tracers in place, and we will need to know uh, where it is in the community. So, yes, he is right, but I don't have the figure with me today. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. My brief supplementary is about in the last. It's actually about the financial 
aspect of this. She talked about the furlough scheme the First Minister did. I think in the, while we've been here debating, uh, Rishi Sunak has announced that there will be some form of extension to the furlough scheme until October. That, I'm sure, is, is welcome, but we need to see much more detail from the Treasury on what that actually means. I want to ask if the First and Deputy First Minister will make representations to the Treasury that that furlough scheme can be flexible in terms of the devolved administrations and reflecting the fact that we may have a different approach to how we come out of this or how we you know, not come out but proceed through the next stages. So the Treasury should be cogniz cognizant of that and willing to give us flexibility in terms of how we deploy that here. And secondly, have they given thought to greater use of Northern Ireland's borrowing powers in terms of uh, how we go about developing uh, the recovery. It wasn't mentioned in last week's budget, but there is our headroom in what's called our RRI borrowing capacity. Will the First and Deputy First Minister give thought to that? Well, we have already discussed uh, looking at our borrowing uh, with the Finance Minister, so he is looking at that at present as to how much that would uh, allow us to have in terms of interventions that we will need, because whilst interventions have been made by the Executive, we know that that's probably not the end of where we need to intervene uh, with. Um, I, I do understand that the Chancellor has indicated, uh, as he says, that the scheme will be in place uh, to October, which is really good news. He's also saying um, that people can come back part-time off furlough, which is also good news because that gives flexibility um, to businesses to plan ahead. Um, in terms of engagement with the uh, Treasury, he will know that that uh, is through the Finance Minister, and there has been a good and open conversation conversation around all of these matters, as indeed there has been uh, by our members of Parliament who uh, are continuously uh, speaking with uh, the Chancellor and indeed all of the other departments in relation to flexibilities needed for the devolved administrations. Call Mr. Doug Beattie. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would just like to thank uh, the, the Ministers for their statement, which is a, a very human statement, and I think we can all um, uh, relate to, to what you uh, have said. Uh, and I welcome the way the executive is working together, and, and, and my colleague and party leader, Steve Aiken, made that absolutely clear. The cohesion is really uh, what we need. And there will be some people who will be out there, and their sole purpose will be to look at this document and find fault. Um, uh, therefore, I hope you don't find that the question I'm going to ask is about picking fault, because it's, it's not. But uh, were I welcome that you're saying this is not calendar-led? How do you square that with the Department for Education setting the transfer dates for the 21st of November, the 28th of November and the 12th of December, and the registration for those transfer dates starts on Thursday? How does that match calendar not being calendar-led? Well, I think the transfer uh, for the transition for next year is, um, as I understand it, the uh, tests have been put back by two weeks, so that's not going to happen to December. We would very much hope that these, these stages are before, so we'll get to stage five before uh, December, and I very much hope that that is the case. Of course, if we get a second peak and we have to pull back again, that's something that we have to do. Uh, so I think that announcement in relation to transition uh, has been made in the hope and the desire that we will be at stage five um, by, by December and that those tests can take place in relation to that. In terms of the Education Minister, I think he is working with the teaching unions and with teachers and with schools to try and plan for a return to school. And of course, we have a different term time than England. I mean, that, that's the reality. Um, uh, if England uh, does decide to go back in terms of primary school children uh, and nursery uh, at the beginning of June, if we were trying to, to manage that, and then all of a sudden term time would end, uh, and actually it might be more disruptive than to use the time to plan actually for the end of the summer to get children back in a socially distanced way. And it will be very difficult and challenging for teachers uh, and pupils alike to come back into that scenario. I do worry about things like sport, for example. What's going to happen to that? Contact sports. Uh, and I know there's a lot of young people who really look forward to sport at school as well, of course, as learning. Uh, but they do enjoy the social aspect of all of that. And, and where that will be, we simply don't know at this point in time. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I'll be very, very, very brief, and, and thank you for the answer, um, uh, First Minister. Um, but I guess the point I'm trying to make is there's a real pressure on the parents now because the registration opens on the 14th of May, and that's a financial commitment that they have to buy into because it's £50 to register for the transfer test and £75 if you don't register on time. So, given this flux that we're in, and I understand we're in this flux, I, I, it's not a criticism, is there any way we can make representations to waive the cost? of registering for the transfer test for this year? 
can hear Mr O'Dowd uh, to my left uh, making some comments from a sedentary position, which I'm not going to pick up on. Um, in relation to transfer, certainly I'm, I'm sure it's something that we can pass on to the Education Minister to take up with the various bodies. <laughs> um, clearly, I do not support academic selection. I don't support the transfer test. I don't think that's where, where we should be. I think that this is the most challenging of years, um, of all years, for, for our young people. And I think for this to be presented to them at the same time, um, in the middle of all of that, is just, it's just not on, uh, in my opinion. That's my, 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 my view on it. Um, but, but you did well. You, you, you set it up. <laughs> The First Minister referred to Mr O'Dowd as being to her left. I think that's an understatement. Um, I call Ms Joanne Bunting. Thank you, Mr Principal, Deputy Speaker. Uh, and I, I'm grateful for the statement. We're witnessing the United States very publicly wrestling with the balance between health and the economy, the loss of life versus the loss of livelihood, both devastating for families. So what reassurance uh, can the First and Deputy First Minister give the business community that we have found the right balance? Um, well, I think, I suppose the, the message we would say is, and I think everybody would understand this, even those in the business community, that um, the initial response to this was that it was a public health issue and we were trying to save lives. But also very mindful of the fact that we were speaking to a lot of business organisations about how we move forward. So the work that was done around working with the Labour Relations Agency and, and the trade unions and the business organisations to create um, very strong guidance for workplaces shows that we were working towards trying to get people back to work um, when that was um, possible. So I think that what we're going to have to do uh, in, in the time ahead is that we work with business organisations, that we communicate um, as we move forward. Like None of us have been here before. Um, this is not like even time of recession. This is, this is a very different space than, that, 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 and challenging space, and we're going to have to work our way through it. But the best way we can do that is actually to communicate that. Um, with the business community. It's not health versus the economy. I think that's a very important message. A healthy population is a more healthier economy. Um, and, and the two things are interlinked and interchangeable. So I think that uh, uh, our job will be to try and communicate a plan um, as soon as we possibly can. And that's what we're working on now. Ms. Bunting. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. Um, We've seen in the national media recently that there's been mention of clusters or bubbles of friends and family with whom we can meet up. And I note, uh, it's a, and it's welcome, um, in step one, that we will be able to meet up with four to six members of our immediate family. W what consideration did the executive give to wider clusters to include friends, and how did we reach this number? Uh, thank the member for a question. I, I think that the groups of four to six people who do not share a household that doesn't have to necessarily be family. That can be, you know, that can be friends. Um, and I think what we're trying to do is that we rec we recognise, and indeed this was a matter that was raised at the executive, that you know some people don't have uh, large families, but they do have a large circle of friends, and they do want to be able to have social contact with those people. Um, and so that's why that is phrased in the way that it is, so that people can have that social contact uh, for a whole variety of uh, of reasons. Um, just in, in relation to, to the furloughing uh, piece, which I think um, the announcement today by uh, the Chancellor is very important um, to extend that into October, because that will mean um, that firms who, if they had to come off furlough at the end of June, would have had to have made some people redundant. I mean, that, that really concerned me. And as someone who was the Economy Minister during the recession, getting redundancy notices nearly daily, it was a really uh, difficult thing to have to cope with. Um, I really welcome the fact that the furloughing scheme has been extended because that means that um, firms may be able to keep people on the furlough instead of making them redundant. And I think that we should really welcome that. And it gives them a chance then to maybe get their orders up again and to look for new business, uh, particularly in the manufacturing sector. So that's something I really welcome. Uh, and I hope that it really helps uh, our economy. Call Ms. Emma Sharon. And I thank the ministers for what is a sensible and thought out approach. I note that the strategy recognises the reality and importance of Ireland as a single epidemiological unit. Um, how will this strategy maximise the opportunity and obvious advantage? Thanks, Emma, for the, for the question. And clearly, we live on an island and we have an advantage because of that, and we have to use that to, to help get us 
Um, through this right now, we have the Memorandum of Understanding, so we are looking at sharing our modelling. Uh, we're, we're working, our two CMOs are working very closely um, across this island, but you're right, we're one epidemiological unit, and we're all really good to be able to say that word, I think. <laughs> um, well, we are one epidemiological unit, and it's important that uh, we understand that, and our Chief Scientific Officer has told us this, that um, the disease spread across the, the island, the trajectory is the same right across the island. The disease knows no, no borders or barriers, so it's important that we move forward uh, as joined up a manner as we possibly can. Um, we've had a number now of um, north-south engagements with ministers, um, uh, north and south, uh, including the Tanisha and ourselves and the two um, health ministers and CMOs. And I think that engagement is crucial as we chart our way um, through this uh, next period ahead. Um, we're all, in, 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 right across this island, we're all in this um, together and we need to work our way out of it as best as we can together. Thank you. Um, glad to hear you saying that the engagement is ongoing north and south and obviously for the number of people that live on either side of the border that would, in ordinary circumstances, cross it on a daily basis. So there's a plan going forward then, I can assume, to continue interaction between north and south. Yes, um, I think we're probably due to meet again um, towards the end of this week, uh, and, and we'll uh, be talking about uh, this plan. We'll be talking about um, how we work our way through it. Um, sorry, I admitted to say earlier the, the meetings that we've had on North South it's ourselves, but it's also um, Branton Lewis, Secretary of State, is also involved in those meetings. We'll have another one of those meetings um, later this week, and it's important that we are as joined up as we can be um, throughout this. Call Ms. Paula Bradshaw. Principal Deputy Speaker, and thank you, um, First and Deputy First Minister. I'm sure it's not been easy the last few months dealing with this, and I thank you for your work. Um, the document references the wider health impact and the phasing and the reintroduction of the usual health and care services, but yet there isn't any detail in the report. Are we to expect a separate report? Well, this is something, again, that we have been uh, focusing on because, as the Deputy First Minister has said, before this crisis we had waiting lists of 305,000 people. Uh, we know uh, that 9,000 elective surgeries have been cancelled, so we know that there's going to be a huge challenge around uh, non-COVID healthcare. Uh, and so the Health Minister is bringing forward a paper to the Executive uh, about the reverse surge, if you like. How do we switch on uh, all of those services again? Uh, I'm sure many have had correspondences from constituents about cancer care, about stroke care, um, about screening, about all of those issues, and indeed I know the member has raised some of these issues herself. Um, so it is important that we have that information uh, and that we can then uh, come to the Assembly. And as I say, the, because the Health Minister is coming to the Chamber on Thursday, he may well be able to say more about that then. Um, as, as the Deputy First Minister mentioned, um, the budget and the state of the health service was not in great, um, uh, great way before the pandemic, so I'm wondering what support the Executive will give to make sure that the budget is sufficient going forward. Well, I can, I can assure the member that out of all of the money that uh, we ha we have, the Executive has distributed on, on um, COVID-19 response, the, the bulk of it has went to health to be able to combat this, and, and we'll continue to work with the Health Minister Nobody's underestimating the challenges that we have. Um, we, after three years of the Assembly being down, we were just back in the door. We were working our way through these things, and obviously COVID-19 hit. So um, it's going to be a very challenging picture, but um, we need to look at how we deliver care. We need to look at all those things. I mean, I had brought forward, as the previous Health Minister, the plan for reform of the health service. That's still relevant, um, maybe more so relevant now. Um, but our waiting lists were atrocious, and we need to get past that, and we need to be able to get people the right care at the right time and collectively that's going to take us all as an executive to work together um, to, be able to, to, to be able to fix that. But I can sh assure you just around the first point you made around um, getting things back to whatever normality looks like in the health service, being able to get those people who had their appointments cancelled, getting them back in the door is so important. I have been lobbied by you know, parents of children with cystic fibrosis who normally have their own specialised clinic who are now being asked to go to a and and that's not a good situation for anyone who's living with cystic fibrosis. For, for obvious reasons, given the respiratory nature of that. So people are, are desperately looking to know when they can get back to their normal clinics and their normal care, and we want to be able to get there. We have to get there as quickly as we can. We have to maintain capability in the health service to deal with any resurgence of COVID-19 um, rising again. Um, but but um, as, as the First Minister said, that the Health Minister is going to bring a plan forward to the executive around that, and then 
obviously he'll communicate that also to the, the Assembly. Call Mr John Stewart. Thank you very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and can I um, thank the First and Deputy First Minister for their statement so far. Can I also echo your words about nurses, especially on International Nurses Day? Uh, not all superheroes wear capes, is the saying, and it couldn't have been written any more um, applicable than to your nurses. Th their selfless commitment is amazing, and I take my hat off to every one of them. Um, given what you've said today about workplaces and the detail around that, um, when can we expect more guidance for employees and employers, and who is responsible for ensuring and enforcing workplace safety? Well, can I thank the member for his specific question in relation to guidance? As I've already indicated, the guidance is actually there already in the form of um, a practical guide to making workplaces safer, which came out from the Northern Ireland Engagement Forum. Um, that gives very clear guidance in relation to safety. Uh, safety in the workplace um, is health and safety executives. Uh, remit, uh, obviously, in some retail outlets and, and uh, issues like that. That's the local councils who would look after uh, that issue. So uh, that is there. And as I understand it, the Department of Business has also launched um, new guidance today about getting us back safely to work as well. So that uh, is there as well. Uh, can I just make a comment in relation to our nursing colleagues? And of course, we do celebrate today the International. Uh, day of the nurse, and I, um, I really want to send my good wishes to everyone uh, in relation to that in, in the public sector. But in the private sector, uh, as I understand it, those people who work in nursing homes, if they have to uh, self-isolate, then all they get is their statutory sick pay. And I think that this is something that we as an executive need to look at. Because it's a private sector, um, that's all they're entitled to. Uh, and I know that the Health Minister has put in money to support care homes. Uh, it's quite a significant amount of money, I think £6.5 million. Um, but we do want to look at that particular issue because we do want to value all of our caring staff. And I think it is important that I say that. Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the First Minister for her answer. It um, does say in, under the current position that um, enhanced messaging around what is permissible in terms of work will come out, and I look forward to that because clarity is key, especially for businesses. They don't want to be breaking the rules. They want to know what it is that they have to do in order to keep their employees safe. Um, when we spoke to the Health and Safety Executive last week at the Economy Committee, I raised that, and they said their remit only extends, as you've said, to manufacturing, industry, and to construction. The rest of it is local government and their environmental health departments. But having contacted a number of those departments this week on the back of that advice, many of them weren't aware of that and aren't aware of the guidance, and probably don't have the people power in place to enforce that. That is concerning. Um, is there anything that the First and Deputy First Minister can do to, um, to ensure that there is the capability there, given whenever workplaces go back? Thank you. We certainly can uh, engage, and actually the Chief Executive's representatives from local government are on our civil contingencies group, um, which, as you know, is part of uh, the Gold Command to deal with uh, the COVID-19 crisis, so we can raise that issue with them in relation to what extra they need uh, in relation to health and safety inspections at local government level, because, of course, there will be a huge increase in people who are concerned, who will want to make representations, uh, and therefore they will need assistance to be able to do that. Thank you. Call Mr Jim Wells. Many of us welcome the very positive tone from the contributions here today. And I think we're all with you in this very, very difficult task you face. But there's always a but, and the but is care homes. And I speak as someone with a direct knowledge of what's going on in care homes. Why are we not in a position to have up-to-date current information as to the number of people in care homes who are affected by the COVID virus, the number of people who have had to go to hospital, and the number of people who have died. Why is that information not being given to us up to date on a daily basis? The member uh, for his question, and I do understand that he would have a, a very personal interest in wanting to make sure that care homes are uh, something that we take a huge interest in, and not just a huge interest in, but huge actions uh, on as well. As I understand it, um, RQIA have been trying to make sure that they get the information from the care homes. And as I've just indicated to the previous members, because they're in the private sector, there isn't the same resilience in terms of the information that is coming forward uh, from those care homes. Now, we are trying uh, to improve the data that we get, and we have made good progress, but there are still, I think it's fair to say, issues around the data that we're getting uh, from our nursing homes and whether it could be used publicly. 
you may say to me, well, I know X number of people died in such and such a nursing home, but that has to be uh, uh, ratified. And as he will know as well, there are very strict uh, and stringent rules about the data that we can put out publicly, and the Office for Statistics is very um, clear about all of that, and there have rules in place. So, whilst we are continuing to work on that and we understand the concern around it, uh, it is important that he realises that there are some issues still surrounding uh, the clarity and resilience of the data that we receive. Mr. Wells, since I've gone public on this issue uh, in the Belfast Telegraph, I've received many calls from throughout Northern Ireland. And what I can tell the honourable members is that the news that is going to come through from the nursing homes is going to be very difficult to accept and very painful for this society. The battle lines in the fight against COVID-19 have moved from our hospitals, who have done tremendously well, and they deserve our praise, to the nursing homes. How can the executive make the strategic decision that they need to make in pouring resources into our nursing homes when we do not have the current figures which are so essential to make those decisions? Even, even without um, having those figures, and we need to get those figures, because people need a very clear picture of exactly what is happening, the level of um, deaths as a result of COVID-19 or associated with COVID-19. And we currently have a situation where we have our, our health figures and then we have our NISRA figures, and that leads to confused picture, and that is not an acceptable position. Um, so that is going to be rectified. I note that the health minister said that he would be um, engaging with NISRA to try and improve that picture. So that's also um, important. But I don't need figures to know that we need to put every bit of energy into the care homes. I don't need the figures to know that the battle lines, as you rightly have said, are now drawn, and that's where we need to be focused in all, in, in all of, our, of our efforts. I don't know if you were in the chamber just when we chatted about this um, earlier on in response to someone else's question. But uh, what I've said then um, stands it's that we need to throw everything but the kitchen sink. And on Thursday, there's going to be a dedicated um, executive discussion where we expect the health minister to bring forward a paper around what additional uh, work can be done to support care homes. Um, throughout the course of this, we've listed um, areas where there's been financial support, where our QIA are playing a certain role, where trusts are being asked to flag the status of their homes. A lot of work has been done, but clearly we need to do more. And I think that what's important is that we get that conversation on Thursday and then we make the strategic interventions, which you have um, rightly uh, pointed to. One of the things that I did um, say earlier, if, if you didn't hear it, is that the executive has agreed as part of our response that there will be, a, um, a, an, a, as a matter of urgency and immediately, um, a testing programme rolled out right across all the nursing homes um, on a rolling basis. But we need to get to the point where there's universal testing in every nursing home. I call Mrs Dolores Kelly. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank uh, the ministers for their uh, statement. Uh, can I ask, uh, in relation to uh, policing the restrictions as they are lifted? Uh, I mean, we all know about the public discourse there was and the lack of clarity around the restrictions. And ob uh, obviously, this is an issue, and I have to declare I'm a member of the policing board. This is not something that the police themselves can do alone. So, how and and what message and communication channels are going to be used by your office? to ensure that people who have started to relax, the vast majority of people, have abided by the regulations, but they have were greatly relaxed, certainly, uh, over the last few days. Of reviewing the regulations on an ongoing basis has been our ability to change them if we need to change them. And we did change them, as the member knows, in relation to the travel for exercise piece, because that was something that the police um, flagged to us that was, it was an issue. Um, something else that we are considering now, and it is already the case uh, in England, is not just having the police as the enforcement uh, agents, if you like, but also looking at whether others, such as council officers, would be involved in enforcing some of the regulations, and that is something that we are actively considering at this present moment in time. Uh, could I welcome uh, that uh, uh, review? And could I also ask, uh, given uh, the HSE, there seems to be an issue about the HSE giving clarity and, and doing regular inspections around workplaces. Would you also be considering using other employees, for example, environmental health officers, and whatever upskilling there would be needed? Uh, you know, whether it's the uh, agricultural uh, department and their inspectors actually playing a role within that broader inspection of workplaces to allay some of the concerns that many staff have? 
think what's important is that we have the appropriate person to enforce, and not just to enforce, to educate as well around uh, the regulations. So uh, in answer to Mr Stewart, I referenced the fact that uh, it was local council uh, employees who would have to enforce non-food retail, for example, in terms of safety and all of those issues. So is there a role for uh, others? We will certainly consider that uh, in terms of health and safety executive uh, or indeed agricultural inspectors as well. But we'll listen to hear what their ministers have to say in relation to their role. But in terms of uh, widening out the scope of enforcement, it's something that we're actively considering at present. Mr Andrew Muir. Much, uh, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the uh, ministers for their statement. Um, the strain on the public finances as a result of COVID-19 has been significant. Uh, we have seen the, the bids that are coming through from each individual department looking for additional funds. I just see what engagements occurred with the UK government about an economic stimulus package, so we can have some certainty in terms of how we plan forward. Because the Barnet consequentials that are coming through, uh, we can't plan ahead, and we've got all these bids that are coming through which we need to be able to fund. So, just see what engagements occurred with the UK government around that. In terms of economic stimulus, I expect that there will be an economic stimulus package later on. I think what we have to do is step people back to work, first of all, and then to see what the impact is in relation to where it is best targeted to. Uh, but in terms of the budget process, uh, we have uh, instructed all of our ministers to look uh, at their departmental budgets to see what they won't be able to spend because of COVID as well, because whilst, of course, we're having to redirect money to deal with the COVID uh, crisis, there are things that departments would otherwise have been doing that they can't do, uh, and therefore that money should come back into the centre so that it can be used uh, in the most proactive and productive way. So those are uh, conversations which are continuing. Very much, Principal Deputy Speaker. One thing has changed quite a lot over the last number of weeks is how we deliver public services, and that transformation has already occurred. There is a lot more that is going to need to take place over the months ahead. And what collective commitment will be there from the executive to ensure that we fund that transformation of public services so how we deliver services going forward is better than what went before? Well, I think that um, out of every negative, you should always try to find a positive, and perhaps there is an opportunity for us to look at how we do things, how we deliver care and the health service, how we uh, respond from any of the public services. Obviously, one of the things that, that was written up as part of the NDNA deal was the fact that we would reform the civil service. That's all work. It's still necessary work. And um, I think that there will be a lot of learning um, in terms of our ability to respond to this crisis right now that will actually factor in and feature as part of um, all those reforms that need to come forward. But, but we certainly do need to, to change how we do things. And I think we would have no choice other than to change how we do things. But it's important that we do it for the right reasons and we actually shape things and take the opportunity to, to learn from good example. There's things that, that if you ask the department to do um, six months ago, that, the, the, that would take them years to analyse and consult and scrutinise and whatever, they were able to turn it around just like that um, because we needed to. Um, so perhaps there's lessons to be learned in all of those things. All have, always having checks and balances, but there is a bit uh, more room and latitude for agility and us to be able to, to shape things very quickly if we can or when we can. Commissioner Rachel Woods. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, and also to join in the condemnation of threats made against members of this House and to journalists. Um, thank you, Ministers, for your statement today. It does, for me, raise many more questions, especially on the returning of work, and no one should return to work unless it is safe to do so, and people do need clarity and reassurance that it is safe. On the document, it acknowledges that people will be concerned for their safety when travelling uh, or attending work. On page 8, the executives say there is an onus on businesses and others to show how they can accommodate the current social distancing. I would like to ask about the executive's responsibility for the implementation of guidance to ensure that businesses operate safely. So, Will there be, through the health and safety executive and councils, an enhanced role in making sure employers comply with this guidance through inspections or the closure of unsafe businesses? I thank the member for a question. Uh, as I have indicated, the engagement forum that was set up uh, by the Department for Economy has brought forward guidance that was brought forward uh, in conjunction with a wide range of, of industry bodies and the trade unions and SOLAS, the local government uh, chief executive's body, the health and safety executive, uh, the public health agency and the labour relations agency. That document has been out. So we're actually ahead uh, of where others are uh, in the United Kingdom. And then today, as I've said, the, uh, the British government has brought out new guidance uh, in relation to the United Kingdom. Uh, 
and what should happen across there. So I would imagine that that will be looked at uh, in the Department of Economy to see what applies to us here in Northern Ireland as well. The Economy Minister will be bringing forward a paper, I hope, within the next week, which will talk about economic recovery and renewal. Uh, as she does that, uh, integral to that will, of course, be guidance on safety and safe working practices. Uh, and I think that that is very important, that it is the key part of us trying to get people to go back to work. Thank you for your answer. Um, First Minister, will the executive commit to take responsibility for the implementation of this guidance issued to businesses? Well, we have already adopted this guidance um, as executive policy, um, and so therefore it is the responsibility of us and uh, the health and safety executive, the local councils, and all of the enforcement bodies to make sure that it is put in place in the appropriate way. And can I say to the member, I have been impressed by the number of employers who are actually ahead and planning uh, for a new work environment. They have spent a lot of money, a lot of time, a lot of resource into looking as to how they can change their working practices, whether that's staggering shifts, whether it's making sure that there's physical barriers between people, whether it's making sure people have their breaks at different times. All of that is very important as we give confidence uh, to people to go back to work uh, and make sure that they have a livelihood at the end of this, because we know uh, that whilst this is a public health crisis, if you don't have a job and if you're in poverty, that has health implications as well. And therefore, there is a need to make sure that we have and continue to try and recover the economy and then to renew it as well. Mr. Jim Allister. Thank you. Um, as I say, the devolved regions were all very happy to be in lockstep with Westminster when it came to receiving and spending the Treasury's generous supports. Now that we've moved to easing out of lockdown, hopefully, there seems to be a preference for difference. Could I suggest to the First Minister that this should not be about the virility of devolution, nor is it about who's got the best slogan, but it could ultimately be about who's got an economy less left. And I'd like to hear from the First Minister a sense of urgency as to the resuscitation of our economy, because the stagnation of the status quo is going to do untold damage. It's very good to have a sat-nav that gives us the direction of travel, but if the sat-nav keeps saying, don't start the engine, then it's not really advancing us, is it? I welcome the fact that the member recognises that this is a sat-nav, so it's been described as a tunnel, and now it's been described as a sat-nav. I'm quite happy to take uh, both of those descriptions. Uh, I absolutely agree with the member that we have benefited greatly from our membership of the United Kingdom in terms of the economic packages that have been shared with us. And, of course, our National Health Service um, uh, is part of uh, our kingdom as well. But what is important is that we have a localised response, and that, you know what? The Prime Minister recognises that. He recognises that through the new Joint uh, Biosecurity Centre. The fact is that we might have to have localised responses in relation uh, to this virus, and he knows that that is the case. Uh, I do agree with him uh, that it isn't so much uh, about the slogan, it's about the actions, and the actions are set out in uh, our paper. It's where we want to go to uh, in relation to getting the economy back up and running again, uh, and I fundamentally believe that Part of this is about public health, part of it is about getting our society back together again, but of course we need a good, strong economy to make sure that we have that in place for the well-being of our people in the future. Yes, but is the problem particularly for Northern Ireland not that whereas you might have all these goals, you can only move to any of them at the pace of the slowest because of the veto operating executive? That we have. So are we, in fact, in this part of the United Kingdom, not more likely to be held back from doing things we need to do for our economy and for these various steps because of the problems of operating mandatory coalition with a veto? And the result, you move at the pace of the slowest. What we're doing is saving lives. That's the executive's primary objective. Um, we're working our way through this. Uh, situation as best as we can. The message remains stay at home. That's what's actually helped us to keep our, our rate down to where it was. 
when wherever we were initially at the, at the outset of this, when, when our first person had died here, and the predictions were telling us 14,000 people were going to lose their lives. We worked our way through this to try and minimise the loss of death. And I am so, like, in one hand, we're, we're, we're very lucky. We're very lucky. But on the other hand, you know, 400, almost 500 people have lost their lives. So I have no other priority here. I don't think anybody else here has any other priority other than to save lives. That remains our guiding compass. We're not standing still. We have a way forward. We have actually set out a pathway through five stages how we will move into recovery. It's our job to make sure that we, whilst we minimise the loss of life, that we try to build our way out of this on the other side of that. And I'm very happy that that's what the executive is doing. Mr. Jerry Carroll. Thank you. I welcome the fact that restrictions haven't been lifted, like in England, but then again, just doing better than Boris Johnson is nothing uh, to brag about. Um, a worker in a food production plant obviously uh, died in recent days, just weeks after workers at this company were forced to work out uh, en masse over health and safety uh, concerns. Their colleagues, union reps, migrants, groups, reader broadcasters and more have been highlighting the lack of testing uh, on those sites, never mind breaches of social distancing and PPE. Uh, it's my view we cannot consider lifting lockdown without first protecting workers in danger today, and there's a strong feeling that the executive hasn't done enough to protect workers in that regard. Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, if workers are forced uh, back to work under unsafe conditions, my advice to them is to follow the Health and Safety Work Regulations 2000 and quote, stop work and immediately proceed to a place of safety. In light of this, I want to ask: uh, Do the ministers think more could have been done? to protect essential workers, and was it a mistake to allow non-essential businesses like Bombardier to reopen? Well, let me say this very clearly, and I hope that the, the workers that you have spoken to who have expressed their concern about their workplace, I hope that you have taken the opportunity to report that to the HSE, as your job as, a, as elected representative would, would uh, compel you to do so. No worker should be going to work in an unsafe situation. It is very, very clear. Anyone who is concerned about their workplace they need to raise that with the HSE. They need to make sure that they flag it up. I absolutely support any worker walking out of the workplace if, if it isn't safe. That is exactly where, where this should be. What we're trying to do here, and I think that I do acknowledge that there has been good work done in terms of the work that was done with the trade unions, with the Labour Relations Agency, and with the business organisations to identify those sectors that could get back to work and could do so if it's safe. And the, the criteria was all set out and the guidance was set out. Every single employer must do the right thing by their staff, and every single employer must adhere to that guidance. And every single worker must be protected if they are if not able to work from home and they are in work. So I think that just to send that message very clearly to all staff out there, because people are still afraid. I, I understand from the very outset of this, people have been very anxious. You are very anxious about not even just yourself, but you are anxious about your family and you know, spreading virus. You are anxious about bringing things home to your family. Um, those are all very reasonable um, feelings to have. Um, but we must send out a very clear message that uh, we must protect the workforce. Employers have a duty to protect the workforce, and anybody who, who is not adhering to the proper guidance and social distancing and protecting their staff needs to be called out. Mr. Carroll. Uh, I thank the Deputy First Minister for her comments, especially when she said she, she would support workers walking out if they feel they are unsafe uh, or in unsafe uh, conditions. And obviously, guidelines have been referred to already, but there are guidelines and then there is enforcement. There are two different things. And I am concerned that step one uh, basically will force more and more workers uh, back into work without robust mechanisms in place to protect them. Uh, I asked the Health Minister um, a few weeks ago. And I didn't get a sufficient or a direct answer. Uh, I'll, I'll ask the, the ministers here today: Is now the time to increase the employment uh, of people inspecting workplaces to ensure the health and safety measures aren't being breached, as more people are likely to go back into work uh, very, very soon? Well, as we've uh, indicated in other answers, the health and safety piece is spread across a, a number of agencies. Obviously, of those agencies are saying to their uh, sponsoring minister that they believe that they need uh, more resource to go out and inspect, and not just to inspect, but to educate and advise and inform uh, employers as to how they can facilitate uh, workers coming back safely. Then, of course, we will look at uh, those bids, and the Department of Finance will look at those bids uh, in a sympathetic way. And finally, finally, Mr. Chris Little. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Can I thank the Executive for this roadmap for Northern Ireland, which will obviously take time to assess? And can I thank the people of Northern Ireland 
for complying with Northern Ireland guidance and ask him, as the First and Deputy First Minister have done, to continue to comply with this guidance to keep saving lives. In terms of education, uh, can I ask the First and Deputy First Minister sincerely, on behalf of many parents that have contacted me, how it is right to require 10-year-old children to sit those transfer tests in November and December of this year, further to several months of remote learning and up to three further stages of blended school and remote learning, when the Executive can take action to change the use of these tests for post-primary transfer admissions? Well, the member knows that uh, parents still want to see academic selection, and he may not agree with academic selection, uh, but most parents in Northern Ireland still believe that that is the best way to decide uh, where to send their child to school. So, as that is the case, and as we listen to those parents, uh, then uh, we believe that that should be facilitated. And of course, if the member has concerns, he should raise those concerns, not just with the Education Minister, uh, but as I've said today, with the uh, two bodies who are arranging the test, and I'm sure he'll have an opportunity to do that at the Education Committee. Thank the First Minister, and I will on Wednesday of this week. Um, the document also states that measures are in place to provide outreach services to children with special educational needs. Families across Northern Ireland are telling me that they are not. Uh, it wouldn't be fair of me to ask the First and Deputy First Minister to outline the services to which this document refers, but can I ask them sincerely to encourage the Education Minister to give an urgent oral statement to this Assembly to tell us what outreach services are in place for children with special educational needs? Yeah, well, well, firstly, just on your first point around um, the, the unregulated um, tests, and it's obviously it's not the Department of Education who set those tests, it's the unregulated bodies. And my position is very clear in terms of I, I agree with yourself that it's very unfair and children shouldn't be put in that position. Um, but on, on, the, on the issue of um, special educational needs and the outreach, um, we're happy to take that on board. I know the Education Minister, I believe, is making a statement to the Assembly on Tuesday of next week, so um, perhaps that's something that we will flag up in advance because we want to make sure we support. Um, it's such a trying time right now for anybody, but for anyone with a child with a disability, it's even more challenging. So we want to make sure that every support's there. And if there are examples of that, then obviously we'd want to raise that and, and make sure that that's um, rectified. Thank you, members. And I thank the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister for coming to the House. By my count, they got through 60 questions between the two of them over the course of that question time. Before we move on to... The members being